Hello. Today I want to take you on a journey, to another place, another time. The look in on a couple of dreamers, that changed the world we live in today. One with bouts of delusions and tendency to self-harm. The other a hothead who can become passionately violent. Both driven to create, where their paths would cross in a very small southern French town confined in a little yellow house in Arles. One searching for companionship and the other looking to stay long enough to figure out his next move. I can only tell you that we may never know the total truth of this clash of two unknown superstars. The truth that was taken to their grave so many years ago. As to their relationship we are going to take a look at the best no theories to understand this unbelievable real story. Let's step into the world of these two. At this time ordinary men and get to know who they are before we start the story of the little yellow house that changed our perception of history of art. Welcome to the Sunday Painter. Come and check out the channel for more art information. Become a Sunday Painter while expanding your knowledge of art. Also, check out my distressed art design for this video. Have some fun and get yours, the link for this and other creative designs is in the description and upper right corner of the channel banner. Always be creative, the first artist we are looking at is Vincent Willem van Gogh. He is famous in our time for sunflowers and the starry night which he thought was a failure. I have another video talking about starry night that is very interesting you should check it out. On the 30th of March 1853 in Zundert Holland, Vincent was born. One of the interesting facts that I found, he was named after his grandfather and his stillborn brother who died one year before he was born. As a child, Vincent was serious, silent and thoughtful. He was to follow in his father's footsteps and become a pastor. Vincent was 27 years old when he painted his first piece. As a young man, he worked as an art dealer, often traveling, but became depressed after he was transferred to London. He turned to religion and spent time as a Protestant missionary in southern Belgium. He drifted in ill health and solitude before taking up painting in 1881, having moved back home with his parents. His younger brother Theo supported him financially, the two kept a long correspondence by letter. His early works, mostly still lifes and depictions of peasant laborers, contain few signs of the vivid color that distinguished his later work. As his work developed he created a new approach to still lifes and local landscapes. His paintings grew brighter as he developed a style that became fully realized during his stay in Arles in the south of France in 1888. During this period he broadened his subject matter to include series of olive trees, wheat fields and sunflowers. In a decade, he created about 2,100 artworks, including around 860 oil paintings, most of which date from the last two years of his life. Vincent sold only one painting during his lifetime. The Red Vineyard. Here's the Red Vineyard. I love it what do you think? Let me know in the comments. Van Gogh wrote over 800 letters in his lifetime. The majority of them written to his brother and closest friend Theo. Van Gogh suffered from psychotic episodes and delusions, and though he worried about his mental stability, he often neglected his physical health, did not eat properly and drank heavily. Vincent was not lucky in love. In August 1881, his recently widowed cousin, Cornelia Kivo Stricker, daughter of his mother's older sister Wilhelmina and Johanna Stricker, arrived for a visit. He was thrilled and took long walks with her. He was seven years older than he was and had an eight-year-old son. Vincent surprised everyone by declaring his love to her and proposing marriage. This is what she said. She refused his proposal with the words, no, nay, never. When I read this my heart went out to Vincent. Vincent was never lucky with women. Listen to this story. Vincent made a domestic arrangement with an alcoholic prostitute, Klesina Maria Sienhornik, she also had a five-year-old daughter. He met Sien towards the end of January 1882 and was pregnant. She had previously borne two children who died, but Van Gogh was unaware of this. On the 2 July, she gave birth to a baby boy, Willem. When Van Gogh's father discovered the details of their relationship, he put pressure on his son to abandon Sien and her two children. Vincent at first defied him and considered moving the family out of the city, but in late 1883, he left Sien and the children. Poverty may have pushed Sien back into prostitution. Sien gave her daughter to her mother and her son Willem to her brother. Willem remembered visiting Rotterdam when he was about 12 when an uncle tried to persuade Sien to marry to legitimize the child. He believed Van Gogh was his father, but the timing of his birth makes this unlikely. 
Xian drowned herself in the river Scheldt in 1904. The truly sad story. But there was one more chance for love, let's take a look. Around August 1884, Margot Benjamin, a neighbor's daughter 10 years his senior, joined him on his forays, she fell in love, and he reciprocated, though less enthusiastically. They wanted to marry, but neither side of their families were in favor. Margot came under strong pressure from her older sisters, she took strychnine and collapsed during a walk with Vincent. Because of the low dose of poison and timely medical help, she survived. The relationship with Vincent then came to an end because his father died of a heart attack and Vincent left Holland. In 1889 he asked his sister Wilhelmina by mail to let Margot receive one of his pictures. For me it looks like he got cold feet and used his father to get out of town in marriage. How did Vincent become so famous after his death, it was done by his sister-in-law, who as I read didn't care for Vincent too much. Theo died in January 1891, removing Vincent's most vocal and well-connected champion. Theo's widow Johanna van Gobonger was a Dutchwoman in her twenties who had not known either her husband or her brother-in-law very long and who suddenly had to take care of several hundreds of paintings, letters and drawings, as well as her infant son, Vincent Willem van Gogh. In 1892, Emile Bernard organized a small solo show of van Gogh's paintings in Paris, and Julian Tangai exhibited his van Gogh paintings with several consigned from Johanna van Gogh in April 1894, the Durand Rule Gallery in Paris agreed to take 10 paintings on consignment from Van Gogh's estate. Van Gogh's nephew and namesake, he inherited the estate after his mother's death in 1925. During the early 1950s he arranged for the publication of a complete edition of the letters presented in four volumes and several languages. He then began negotiations with the Dutch government to subsidize a foundation to purchase and house the entire collection. In this first part of the video, I wanted to make the two artists real to us. Not by telling you the usual facts that make them great, but to demonstrate that they had the same struggles as we do. So, we see some of Van Gogh's interesting stories that you don't normally find. What can we find on Gauguin before I tell the story of how these giants came together in a little yellow house? Also, looking into the ghoulish severed ear and prostitute reactions who thought it may be a gift. Interesting. Eugene Henry Paul Gauguin born in Paris on 7 June 1848. He is now recognized for his experimental use of color and synthetist style that were distinct from Impressionism. Unappreciated until after his death. We know him best for his colorful Tahiti paintings. Let's go back a couple of generations to set his story. We start with his maternal grandmother, Flora Tristan, was the illegitimate daughter of Therese Laisnay and Don Mariano de Tristan Moscoso. Don Mariano came from an aristocratic Spanish family from the Peruvian city of Arequipa. Members of the wealthy Tristan Moscoso family held powerful positions in Peru. Nonetheless, Don Mariano's unexpected death plunged his mistress and daughter Flora into poverty. Flora eventually sailed to Peru in hopes of enlarging her share of the Tristan Moscoso family fortune. This never materialized, but she successfully published a popular travelogue of her experiences in Peru which launched her literary career in 1838. Paul's maternal grandmother helped lay the foundations for the 1848 revolutionary movements. Placed under surveillance by French police and suffering from overwork, she died in 1844. He idolized his grandmother and kept copies of her books with him to the end of his life. In 1850, his father and mother departed for Peru with their young children in hopes of continuing his journalistic career under the auspices of his wife's South American relations. He died of a heart attack en route, and a line his mother arrived in Peru as a widow with the 18-month-old Paul and his two-year-old sister, Marie. She was welcomed by her paternal granduncle, whose son-in-law, José Rufino Echenique, would shortly assume the presidency of Peru. At the age of six, Paul enjoyed a privileged upbringing, attended by nursemaids and servants. He retained a vivid memory of that period of his childhood, which instilled indelible impressions of Peru that haunted him the rest of his life. Ogan's idyllic childhood ended abruptly when his family mentors fell from political power during Peruvian civil conflicts in 1854. His mother returned to France with her children, leaving Paul with his paternal grandfather, Guillaume Gauguin, in Orleans. Deprived by the Peruvian Tristan Moscoso clan of a generous annuity arranged by her granduncle, she settled in Paris to work as a dressmaker. In 1871, Gauguin returned to Paris where he secured a job as a stockbroker. 
the close family friend, Gusta Verosa, got him a job at the Paris Bourse, Gauguin was 23. He became a successful Parisian businessman and remained one for the next 11 years. In 1879 he was earning 30,000 francs a year, about $145,000 US as a stockbroker and as much again in his dealings in the art market. But in 1882 the Paris stock market crashed and the art market contracted. Gauguin's earnings deteriorated sharply and he eventually decided to pursue painting full-time. In 1873 before the crash, he married a Danish woman, met Sophie Gad. Over the next 10 years, they had five children. During this time, he was still dreaming of becoming an artist and she thought she married a successful businessman. This turned out not to be the case. After the crash, by 1884, Gauguin had moved with his family to Copenhagen, Denmark, where he pursued a business career as a tarpaulin salesman. It was not a success. He could not speak Danish, and the Danes did not want French tarpaulins. Met became the chief breadwinner, giving French lessons to trainee diplomats. His middle-class family and marriage fell apart after 11 years, when Gauguin was driven to paint full-time. He returned to Paris in 1885 after his wife and her family asked him to leave because he had renounced the values they shared. Gauguin's last physical contact was with them in 1891 and Med eventually broke with him decisively in 1894. This would give Gauguin the opportunity he was looking for so long. To become a full-time artist. The eager Gauguin initially found it difficult to re-enter the art world in Paris and spent his first winter back in real poverty, obliged to take a series of menial jobs. During this first year, Gauguin produced very little art. He exhibited 19 paintings at the 8th and last Impressionist exhibition in May 1886. Gauguin spent the summer of 1886 in the artist's colony of pont aven in Brittany. He was attracted in the first place because it was cheap to be there. He was remembered during that period as much for his outlandish appearance as for his art. I could go on with more of his history, but I don't find that necessary. We know that he had a difficult time with his art as he did with people. Also, we have established that he traveled looking for cheap places to paint and work, which will take us to Van Gogh and the Little Yellow House. One last thing that I need to mention, he was an accomplished boxer and fencer. This will come into play later in the Little Yellow House story, possibly giving a twist to the many stories that art historians have speculated. To start out the story we must know how Vincent and Paul meet. Gauguin had his Martinique paintings that were exhibited at the Arsene Poitiers gallery where Vincent and his brother Theo saw them. Liking three of his paintings, Theo purchased them for 900 francs. He would resell the works at Gaupel, a high-end art dealer, where Theo worked. This would introduce Gauguin to wealthy clients. Vincent and Paul became friends, it was said that Vincent was awestruck with Gauguin. They corresponded together on art, a correspondence that was instrumental in Gauguin formulating his philosophy of art. Van Gogh moved to Provence in the south of France to the small town of Arles. He rented a small cozy house soon after his arrival in 1888. For the only time in his adult life, he had a real home of his own. I live in a little yellow house with a green door and shutters, whitewashed inside, he wrote excitedly to his sister Will. Once there and living in the yellow house, he came up with an idea to start an artist's colony. Dreaming of the perfect place where artists could share ideas. Arles was low-rise houses with sun-bleached shutters line its narrow pedestrianized streets. The sweeping curve of the Rhone embankment is never far away, along with remnants of the ancient ramparts that once surrounded the city's historic center. Sounds fantastic, now I want to go there and paint. Vincent was filled with ideas for this artist's colony and, as he did so often, he became obsessed with the idea. He wrote to Gauguin repeatedly asking him to come down and paint in the yellow house. Gauguin came up with one excuse after another why he couldn't come right away but would one day. Gauguin was self-centered, judgmental, and lacking in any empathy. Finally, Gauguin gave in and went to Arles. Maybe because he was running out of money or to appease Theo who was buying his work. Van Gogh couldn't be more excited when Gauguin arrived. His friend was coming so they could paint together. Having furnished the studio, he created paintings specifically to decorate it for Gauguin's arrival. Vincent thought strategically of what paintings he wanted in his studio to show Gauguin. He chose a theme, sunflowers, and set about painting them. Gauguin was not impressed. 
the first few weeks were fine. Then, one day, Van Gogh brought up a subject of inviting other artists to join them. It came as a shock when Gauguin told him he wasn't interested in starting an artist's colony. They lived together, sharing costs, drinking significant amounts of absinthe, this was dangerously addictive psychoactive drug and hallucinogen, it's like throwing gasoline onto a raging fire, then jumping in. They painted the same subjects. Van Gogh in particular was especially prolific. Sadly, their friendship eventually deteriorated and their living situation became untenable. The relationship was unbalanced, with Van Gogh frequently taking advantage of Gauguin, dipping into his money and failing to help with household chores. But it was above all quarrels over art that pushed the pair apart, and on 23 December 1888 a violent dispute about painting erupted in which Gauguin argued it was important to work from imagination, while Van Gogh maintained paintings should be based on nature. What made things worse, he told Van Gogh he was leaving. This leads us to how Van Gogh cut his own ear off. This is infamous in the art world, and many have heard this story which may not be true after all. Let's take into account the story everyone knows and learn what may have really happened. As you can see the situation was tense. According to Gauguin, Van Gogh threatened him with a knife. Terrified, Gauguin immediately left. Van Gogh, finding himself alone and in the thralls of madness, appears to have then cut off part of his left ear with a razor, which he then wrapped in newspaper and took to a prostitute named Rachel, whom he saw regularly. He then went to bed. He was only found by the police the next day, confused and his head covered in blood. Gauguin explained what had happened to the police before leaving Arles definitively. Could this have possibly happened, sure, but I want to put a twist into what makes more sense into the cutting off of the ear. The new book, published in Germany by Hamburg-based historians Hans Kaufmann and Rita Wildegans, argues that Vincent van Gogh may have made up the whole story to protect his friend Gauguin, a keen fencer, who actually lopped it off with a sword during this heated argument. The historians say that the real version of events has never surfaced because the two men both kept a pact of silence, Gauguin to avoid prosecution and Van Gogh in an effort trying to keep his friend with whom he was hopelessly infatuated out of jail. The official original version is largely based on Gauguin's accounts. It contains inconsistencies and there are plenty of hints by both artists that the truth is much more complex than the story we've all known. They carefully re-examined witness accounts and letters written by both artists, and they came to the conclusion that Van Gogh was terribly upset over Gauguin's plan to go back to Paris after the two men had spent an unhappy stay together at the Yellow House. Here's how the story may have gone. On the evening of December 23, 1888 Van Gogh became very aggressive when Gauguin said he was leaving him for good. The men had a heated argument near the brothel and Vincent might have attacked his friend. Gauguin, wanting to defend himself and wanting to get rid of the madman, drew his weapon and made a move towards Van Gogh and by that, he cut off his left ear. We do not know for sure if the blow was an accident or a deliberate attempt to injure Van Gogh, but it was dark and we suspect that Gauguin did not intend to hit his friend. The brothel was close, so Vincent wrapped his ear in newspaper and took it to the prostitute Rachel, looking for help. Gauguin left Arles the next day and the two men never saw each other again. In the first letter that Vincent Van Gogh wrote after the incident, he told Gauguin, I will keep quiet about this, and so will you. That apparently was the beginning of the Pact of Silence. Years later, Gauguin wrote a letter to another friend, and in the reference about Van Gogh he said, a man with sealed lips, I cannot complain about him. This is what most likely would have happened, taking the truth of that night to their graves. I hope you enjoyed watching. Have a great day.